In this video, I will talk about a topic that is important for all of anatomy and physiology. This topic is homeostasis. I'm going to break this topic down into the following points. First, we'll look at what conditions, what are the conditions that our body and our cells need to survive. And how do we make sure that we stay at those conditions even if it's dry or humid or hot or cold outside? Basically, how do we keep a stable internal environment in the face of a changing outside world? In order to live, all of the cells in our body normally need some complement of nutrients, oxygen, and water. We need to eat, drink, and breathe to satisfy these demands. Why do the cells in our body need these materials? Well, I'm not going to cover that and answer that question in this video, but it does have to do with all of the different chemical reactions that are occurring in the cell. The life of many of our cells and our own survival also depends on a relatively stable internal environment. We can only tolerate small changes in our internal temperature, blood pressure, or a host of other conditions. If you have an iPhone and you've ever left it on a hot surface for too long, you may have seen this message. Our bodies are no different, and our cells cannot survive long if they are overheated. This might seem like common sense. You might know that your normal body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we can go outside in cold weather, but the inside of our bodies will stay warm around this temperature. If you go out and stay out too long and it is too cold out, your internal temperature will drop and you'll get frostbite. Likewise, staying outside in the heat too long can give you heat stroke or dehydrate you. In other words, changes to your internal body temperature can be harmful. Now, everybody watching this video, I'm sure, has been outside when it was too cold or outside when it was too hot. And you know that when you are cold, you shiver uncontrollably. When you are overheating, you'll sweat. These changes, as we'll see in a moment, are your body's way of trying to counteract the drop in temperature and keep your internal cells at a nice 37 degrees Celsius. Our bodies have the ability to respond to changes in either the internal or external conditions to maintain the normal levels of temperature, blood pressure, and other features necessary for life. This ability to respond to these changes and restore and remain balanced is known as homeostasis. One way to remember this term and what it means is to think of a home. In a home, you might have several systems built in to help keep you comfortable. You might have an air conditioner for when it's too hot outside, a radiator for when it is too cold. You might have a humidifier or a dehumidifier if needed and you have lights for when it's dark. These things allow you to keep your home in homeostasis. No matter what the conditions outside and how they change, you can keep the inside of your home well lit at a nice uh, 22 degrees Celsius or about 72 Fahrenheit and keep a balanced humid humidity. In some cases you might not even to ma need to manually change these settings. Some things like the radiator might only turn on when it becomes colder than the set, uh, set temperature point. We'll come back to this idea in a moment. Our bodies also exhibit homeostasis. For a simple example, consider what happens if you're outside and it's too hot. Something in your body recognizes that the temperature outside is high and that it would be dangerous and you would overheat if you didn't respond, that your internal temperature is slowly beginning to rise. This signal leads your body to respond by producing sweat. In this case, the evaporation of your sweat draws heat energy from your body and lowers your internal temperature back down to normal. In similar fashion, your body can detect a drop in internal temperature. 
This causes involuntary shivering. And this movement, the shivering movement, can generate small amounts of heat, thus warming your temperature back to normal. If you didn't know that muscle movement can produce heat, think about what happens when you're at normal temperature but then you work out or go for a run or otherwise engage in vigorous muscle activity. This raises your temperature above normal and you begin to sweat. We can generalize this process for changes in more than just temperature. Homeostasis requires three general steps. First, some receptor detects the change in the environment. Second, the receptor signals to some control center. The control center will be able to recognize if the change is too big or requires some response. If a response is needed, a signal is sent to what is known as an effector, and action is taken to restore normal conditions. Let's walk through this process again with more detail. A change or stimulus is producing an imbalance in the body. The imbalance could be that the temperature is too high, or that blood pressure is too low, or that salt content in the blood is too high. The stimulus is simply a change in some variable. Our body is equipped with all different types of receptors. Each one can detect one or more types of stimulus. The receptor sends information about the variable or stimulus, like temperature, to a control center. The information traveling from receptor to control center is known as the afferent pathway. If the control center decides to respond to the stimulus to fix the imbalance, it sends a signal to the effector and sends this signal along the efferent pathway. One way to remember the differences between these pathways is that the efferent goes to the effector. You could also remember that the effect, as opposed to affect, that the effect is a end result or an action or the direct consequence of a change. The response by the effector will bring the variable back into balance with the rest of the body and restore everything to a homeostatic level. One example of this that we've already talked about is the response our bodies exhibit to a shift in temperature. Heat stimulus is detected by the skin and a part of the brain interprets this change and responds by activating sweat glands. The skin also can detect a temperature imbalance in the other direction when it is too cold and the brain again again interprets the change but in this case responds differently causing the shivering movement until temperature returns to normal. The symptoms of a lot of diseases and disorders in the human body occur because something is interfering with homeostasis, the body's normal process for maintaining balance. And here when I use the word balance I don't mean being able to balance your posture, I mean balance of all your internal conditions. One example common to everyday life is that of a cold sweat and shivering during a fever or, or an infection. If you ever experience the chills of a fever, despite not physically being exposed to the cold, you might be familiar with this failure of homeostasis. During some infections, the normal temperature set point of 37 degrees Celsius in the temperature control center of your brain is changed to a higher temperature level. Let's say this sort of thermostat in your brain is moved from 37 degrees up to 40 degrees, which is a fever of about 104 Fahrenheit. Now, even in normal conditions, your brain will think that you are too cold and will respond <clears throat> to your skin reporting a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius by making your muscles shiver until your body reaches its fever temperature of 40. You might even sweat the fever out later when the control center is reset back to 37 until the, real, uh, and the brain realizes it must lower the temperature back down to normal. In the examples we have covered so far, you may have noticed that the action is taken only so long 
as needed to restore balance. For example, if you are cold one day and you shiver and warm yourself back up, you do not continue to shiver for the rest of the week. The shivering response is shut off once balance is restored. Our bodies use feedback mechanisms to make sure that the effectors function with the type of response and timing that is needed. I've just mentioned one type of feedback, negative feedback. This helps stop effectors from doing too much, from wasting energy or overshooting the mark. On the flip side, positive feedback can get effectors to generate very intense and rapid effects. Most of the examples we've talked about so far, and in fact most of the examples you'll see of this in the human body, use negative feedback. Negative feedback mechanisms are common in our body, as it helps get the result needed without wasting energy or overshooting the mark. Even the example of a thermostat and a radiator mentioned earlier in this video is an example of negative feedback. Positive feedback is less common, but it is still sometimes found controlling systems in our body. In positive feedback, the response by the effector exaggerates the original signal. This leads to an amplified or fast response, otherwise known as a cascade effect. One example of this is blood clotting, where a leak in a blood vessel must be rapidly repaired. Contractions during labor also exhibit a positive feedback control strategy, leading to more frequent and more intense contractions during labor up until the moment of childbirth. To review, remember that homeostasis is your body's ability to maintain stable internal conditions despite a changing outside environment. Think of the home with the thermostat. Your body acts in a similar way, although it has different receptors, control systems, and effectors. In the examples we talked about, the skin detected temperature changes and the brain decided to either activate sweat glands to cool off or to activate shivering movements in the muscles to warm up. Your body usually maintains homeostasis by controlling different effectors in a negative feedback fashion, which helps conserve energy. Positive feedback is sometimes used for a fast and intense response, but it is not as common. 